Bismillah, alhamdulillah. You're watching Lifting the Fog. And I'm your host, Yusuf Estes. For the next few minutes, we want to talk on the subject of removing and clearing up some of the misconceptions, misunderstandings, and misrepresentations about Islam and what Islam teaches. Our program today is going to be a continuation of a program we were doing earlier on the subject of the treatment of women in Islam. We mentioned in our other program that there's a chapter of the Quran called An-Nisa, meaning the women. This is a whole section of Quran dedicated to the better understanding of what we said about rights and limitations in Islam. We also discovered in our previous program that, in fact, women have rights that they were never afforded before Islam came. Also, men had limits that they had never experienced prior to Islam. And together, these two together, the rights and the limits, bring about a whole way of life. We also discovered that in general, this is the way Islam approaches everything, showing you the rights and showing you the limits. I recall that when I was still a Christian, when I encountered the person that helped me get to Islam, that that was some of the most important part of his talks, his speeches to me, were on the subject of rights. I recall one of the times we were together and he was talking about the heart of a human being, regardless of whether it was a Muslim, a Christian, a Jew, or any person. But the heart of the human being is something so dear to Allah that He does not like anybody to even scratch the dignity of a person's heart. And when He used that term, I said, what a beautiful teaching. Don't even scratch a person's dignity because you hurt the heart. You've done an amazing thing. Something not good whatsoever. I recall also talking about the rights. Constantly, Islam is coming up with what is the rights of a particular part of Allah's creation. Of course, we mentioned in our previous program, the first rights in Islam are Allah's rights. His right to be worshipped alone without partners. That's number one. And of course, the saying in Islam is, La ilaha illallah. There is none that has the right to be worshipped. Only Allah, and all worship is only for Him. La Sharik Allah. He has no partners. After that is the right of Muhammad to be regarded as a messenger and servant of Almighty God, as such to follow these teachings that He's presenting Muhammad or Rasulullah. And then after that is the rights that the parents have over us. Then after that is the rights that we have in our family, the rights that we have as being husbands and wives and children. And of course, the other side is the limits. The limits, the limits. Without the limits, what are the rights? And so Islam is bringing this beautiful balance. Now, when we talk about women, and this is specifically what we want to do tonight, someone came to me one time and they said, how can you be in a religion? that allows a 53-year-old man to have sex with a six-year-old girl. A'udhu Billah. As soon as I heard this, I was so angry. I felt inside that I, I was going to explode. How could somebody say such a statement? It indicated, it indicated to me that, that this is a person who either doesn't understand real Islam or else this is a person who's trying to start a fight because this is not something tolerant. Tolerated in Islam at all. Even now talking about it, I, I feel it again. Because it's a lie, number one, and it misrepresents everything Islam is all about. But let's break it down. Suppose somebody came to you with that. And well, what would you do? I hope that you would benefit from these programs. I hope I benefit from it as well for this. To learn how to control ourselves when people approach us with that. We must not react. Not, not react in kind. What we have to do is be even kinder. Somebody comes to you with this question. How can you be in a religion where a 53-year-old man has sex with a 6-year-old girl? Remember this. The Prophet ﷺ, peace be upon him, was attacked much harsher 
by the people of Ataif. So it's up to us to respond like this. Thank you for asking me about my religion. Now they're going to go, huh? Thank you for asking me about my religion. In Islam, it's forbidden for us to lie. If we lie, we can go to hell forever. And Islam, we have the proof. We have the clear evidences. The texts have been authenticated and preserved for 1,400 years. Even if I did lie, you could prove quickly that that's incorrect. So we have the truth and we have the proof. But we have something else too. What we have here is a way to present the wisdom or the hikmah of an answer. And that's now going to be your responsibility to show the people the real truth of Islam. And you do that by looking in, examining the question itself. Is there, in fact, in the question a false statement? Because if that's the case, then we have to straighten the question out before we can answer it. And then ask them, while we're giving the answer, if you hear something that you like, and you say, gee whiz, that's, that's nice, I didn't know that. And you admire it, and you say, yeah, I want that for me. Then are you going to be prepared to reconsider your position and consider worshiping your God and my God and your Lord and my Lord, worshiping Him on His terms without partners? Because you see, in fact, that's all Islam is about anyway. Worshiping God, doing what He wants you to do. But now let's come back to your question. You ask me about an age difference, 53 and 6, and you ask about specifically a verb, an action, which is sex. To have sex. I will share with you something that if the question contains a mistake in it, I can't answer it. Example. If you came to me and you said, By the way, Yusuf, is your mother out of jail yet? Yes or no? This is the two choices. Yes or no? How can I answer this question? My mother's never been in jail. Oh, nope. Yes or no? Is she out of jail? Well, she's not in jail. Therefore, she's out of jail. Okay, my mother's out of jail. Good, I'm glad she got out. She never was in. So no matter how I answer this question, it's a trap. I can't answer a question like that because it has what? It has a lie in the question. So let's go back and look again. The verb, the act of sex. If somebody said, does your religion permit a 53-year-old man to have sex with a 6-year-old girl? The answer is no. Because in Islam, it is not permitted a man of any age to have sex with a woman of any age. There is no sex in Islam except through what? Legitimate contractual marriage. There has to be something which is legitimate in Islam established for the benefit of the woman and the benefit of the man because of the rights and the limits that we've been talking about. The mistake here is to forget when we're talking to these people, they're meaning one thing and we mean something else. We're considering, as Muslims, they're talking about the relationship of a man and a woman in marriage. Whereas they're just talking about sex, period. This is a mentality that is derived from years and years of being exposed to television and movies and periodicals, magazines, newspaper, radio, etc., and these trash magazines at the checkout counter of the grocery store, sex, sex, sex. This is on their brain. It's not permitted in Islam. We don't have boyfriends and girlfriends. We don't have mistresses. We don't have these prostitutes, I'm sorry to say, but we don't have these kinds of things in Islam. This is not a part of Islam. It's all forbidden. What do we have? What we have in Islam is marriage. And that's it. If a man is married, it is forbidden for him to have a girlfriend or to have a mistress. Any of these kinds of things or just what they call one night stand. All of these things are so forbidden in Islam, a man can be punished severely for such a thing as this. And of course, I have to tell you, the same is true for the woman. If the woman would engage in something outside of marriage, she likewise can be punished. It's in the Islamic law. Marriage is a sacred, sacred thing in Islam from the standpoint that once you enter into this contract, you don't break it. 
but it's the only way you're going to have a sexual relationship. When there is sex and there is a child, that child has rights. Right? The woman has rights, the man has rights, the child has rights, but it comes about through a contract, something that's signed up front that people understand what it's all about. So, the answer to the question is, that doesn't exist in Islam. Now, I know what's going to happen. <laughs> They're going to say, yeah, we're talking about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and blah, 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 and his relationship with one of his wives, and she was a little girl. Oh, hold it. Let's go back. It was a marriage. And let's go and look at the text itself. I told you, in Islam, we can prove what we're saying. We have the proof. Let's look. You're going to go to Sahih al-Bukhari. And you're going to pull up a statement in there, in English translation, talking about Aisha, and she's six years old. Okay. But did you know that that's not what it says? It doesn't say sex anywhere in there. And by the way, this is on her authority. She's the one narrating this. So before we go any further, I'm going to ask you, do you accept Aisha as being a truthful source of information? Because if you don't, there's no point in going any farther. And if you are going to accept what she says, are you going to accept everything she says? Or just what you want to hear? Because she also said, La ilaha illallah. She also said there's no God to worship except Allah. Do you believe that? Are you going to accept that? Never mind. Let's just keep moving. She tells us in this authentic hadith teaching or story in Islam that she was outside playing. She's playing in the dirt, having fun. And her mother, now listen to this, her mother comes to her and takes her inside. Who's inside? Inside is her father. And her father is talking to her father's best friend. And distant cousin, which happens to be Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa peace be upon him. There is something being presented or offered here, which is marriage. The father is offering her hand in marriage to his best friend. But it didn't happen because she said, and read it for yourself, she went back outside and was playing in the dirt. Why didn't it happen? And what did really happen? And when did it happen? The answer to these questions and more are coming up in the next part of this program, the next segment. So be sure you stay tuned to hear the answers to this when we return with Lifting the Fog. We'll be right back after this. Subhanallah Walhamdulillah Wa la ilaha illallah Wallahu Akbar Subhanallah Walhamdulillah Wa la ilaha illallah Wallahu Akbar Subhanallah Walhamdulillah Wa la ilaha illallah Wallahu Akbar Bismillah, alhamdulillah. We're back. You're watching Lifting the Fog. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, and we've been talking about a very serious subject. The general topic, of course, is the rights and the limitations in Islam. But additionally, we've been talking about the position of the women and specifically dealing with this question mark of what is the relationship here between Muhammad, peace be upon him, and a young girl. Because the accusation comes that how can you be in a religion where a 53-year-old man is having sex with a 6-year-old girl? And we found in the first segment that absolutely this is a lie. It's not true. There is nothing like this in Islam. We found that Islam does not permit any kind of sexual relationship outside of marriage. So the first thing we have to find out about is about marriage. And we discussed that to some extent. Then we mentioned the person who actually is relating or narrating the story to us is who? It's Aisha herself. And she is the wife of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Let's look at their specific condition about this man and this woman together and what was the true relationship and how did it come about. We spoke of a hadith where we found that she was six years old and her mother had brought her into the house 
so that she could hear her father offer her hand in marriage to his best friend, which happened to be the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Uh, peace be upon him. Uh, but she tells us that she went back outside because it didn't happen. Let's look in the Quran and see what we find about this. Chapter 4. Now, we're talking about An-Nisa. Chapter An-Nisa, chapter 4 of the Quran is dealing with the women. Look at verse number 19. If you have a translation, if you don't have, go to our website and get one. They're free. Download. Put it in your computer. Verse 19 says, The believers, oh you who believe, you cannot inherit women against their will. As we discussed in previous programs, it was a practice of the ignorant pagans, the Mushrikeen of the Arabian Peninsula, that they would try to inherit the children's wealth. And what they would do, let's say, for instance, that some parents die, and here's a six-month-old girl or an 18-month-old girl, a baby, and he can say, that's my wife, and just claim her as a wife to do what? To take her wealth away. So now it comes that, no, you can't do that. If you look in the first part of this chapter, you'll find that that's exactly what it's talking about in dealing with the wealth of these little girls, that you're not permitted to marry these little girls to steal their wealth or mingle it with your money. And when the subject of marriage comes up, marry other women. But we're not on that subject tonight. We already talked about that. But this particular verse here in verse 19 is saying you can't inherit these women against their will. You're not allowed to get married to these girls until they're old enough to make a choice. And they're not old enough to make a choice until what? Until they are old enough to have a baby. Now, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the example for us throughout the rest of history till the last day to see how to deal in these particular instances so that we can give these rights and stay within these limitations. Here's a girl. Let's say that she's an orphan. Can I marry her? Well, is she mature enough to have a baby? No. Then no, you can't marry her. Because there's nobody here to sign for her to say that, okay, this is my daughter, you can have her. She has nobody. So it has to be that her parents are there or somebody responsible for her, and she has to be old enough to do what? To have a baby. And that is why, when Aisha was only six years old, that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, obviously did not accept these terms because the girl isn't old enough. Not that he didn't want to be married to the daughter of his very best friend, his lifelong companion, which was Abu Bakr. That was not the reason. Because in those days, if you would reject a marriage offer, or if you turned down an offer that was being made in marriage for somebody in your family, it could cause a big tribal scene, a big problem. But here is Muhammad, who is not marrying, peace be upon him, not marrying the daughter of his best friend. And there's only one reason why. Because it wouldn't be considered right in Islam. She's not old enough. Because keep reading, you find another hadith in Sahih Bukhari, another story, and it's clearly stating now she's older. Several years have gone by, and the similar situation takes place. They bring her into the house, and now she is old enough to have babies. She has started her menstrual cycle, and now the example for us comes that, yes, as soon as they're old enough, to really be a mother, to have a baby, that's the earliest they can be married. And it was offered again, and it was accepted by Muhammad, wasallam. peace be upon him. But watch this. She again, talking about Aisha, radiallahu anhu, may Allah accept from her, tells us that they were married. Married, married. Focus on this word marriage, because that's what they had, a marriage. And she says that when they were married... They played together. They had fun. They romped together. They chased each other. They had races. She talks about this herself. And he, peace be upon him, talks about it to his companions to mention that if you have a chance to marry a virgin girl, then raise her up and have fun with her and play with her. The emphasis was on what? To have a companionship in developing this love between each other. She's the one who talks about sex in other hadiths. And she narrates over t- about 2,200 roughly authentic hadiths or stories coming from her. Many of them dealing with the relationship of a man and a woman. And yes, she talks about sex in the most beautiful and sweet way 
a way that if you read it, you say, oh my God, isn't this nice? Talking about how a man is to be intimate with his wife, being close to her and coaxing her and just not being rude, not being crude, not just going to her like an animal, no. Going to her in the most beautiful way. Now, watch this. She is considered to us today to be one of the top scholars of Islam, especially in the areas of a woman. She was married to Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, until he passed away. And he passed away in her arms with his head in, in her lap. And she had so much love for her husband. Do you know that she never, ever, ever spoke bad about him? She never uttered a word in all of these hadiths or stories that would even disparage her husband even the least little bit. And do you know that she never even considered being married to another man? Think about this. In fact, her honor and her dignity with this respect is defended by Allah. Allah defends her in the Quran in chapter 24, Surah An-Nur, in the most beloved way to show that this is a woman who is beyond reproach when it comes to the, the subject on this sex. So, so much dignity, so much respect is here for her. And look at this. She lived into her 70s, always speaking the very best way about her husband. And I ask you to be honest. Do you know any woman that could do that today? Even go 70 days without saying bad against her. How about 70 minutes? How about seven minutes that a woman doesn't say something against her own husband? This has become a topic of a joke in the situation comedies called sitcoms. This is the way they act in television all the time, making jokes about the husband, making jokes about the family, cutting down the husband, and making fun of him. And this lady, this highly respected mother of the believers, as she's called, never said anything like this or even indicated it was permissible to talk like this. In fact, I'd like to share something with you and I'd like you to think about this real deep. There's a famous love story in the English language. It's considered a classical love story called Romeo and Juliet. It's written by Shakespeare. Even Muslims, by the way, know this story very well. It's a story of two young lovers who love each other so much, but their tribes were feuding against each other in such a horrible way that it was not even considered a possibility that they should even talk to each other, much less ever get married. These two young teenagers, like 12 or 13 years old, by the way, approximately the age of Aisha when she's getting married. Here they are, lovers, not married. They can't be together, so they're so distraught one of them takes poison and the other kills themselves. Double suicide. And that's considered a love story. I'd like you to do something and I want you to think about what I'm going to offer you right now. I would like you to take the stories of Aisha and Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, and remove from these stories, these hadiths, the teachings of Quran, remove anything which has to do with time, date, place, or name. So nobody will be able to identify except the story itself. Then I want you to take that story, this beautiful story, this relationship, take that to any psychiatrist that you know. Take it to any sociologist. Take it to any marriage counselor. Take it to any social worker. And let them read the story. And then ask him, what do you think about this story? The story of a relationship between this man and this woman. They're playing together. They're having fun together. She said, we used to race and, and he would chase and, and I would beat him. But then I got older and I got heavier and then he would beat me. She used to talk about the relationship in such a sweet way that, that there could be no mistake of this great grand affection that they had. So much so that even when he was dying, he wanted to be in her arms. And what do you think they're going to say when they read this story? I venture the guess they're going to tell you, this is the story that Shakespeare meant to write, to have a real beautiful love story where not only do they live here happily ever after, but when they die, they die and go to Jannah 
and live happily ever after there. That's the real story. You're talking about a love story that's the best love story that this earth has ever seen between a man and a woman. Having said that, I want you to think about something. You came to me with an innuendo. You implied something very filthy and very dirty. And now you found something very beautiful and very, very sweet. If you recognize now that someone has lied to you, if you see that this has been misrepresented to you, if you can see now this fog lifting up, can you look into your own heart and can you realize that this is another indication why you and I should consider worshiping our Lord alone without any partners? Couldn't we worship the God of Muhammad, the God of Aisha, the God of Abraham and Adam. Worship Him without partners and ask Him to open our minds and open our hearts to this real truth because that's really what this is all about. And we pray and ask Allah to lift this fog from all of our hearts and our minds.